Jamal Johnson, a 17-year-old dishwasher, trudged through the sweltering streets of South Beach, Miami. The scorching summer sun beat down on his worn-out clothes and battered cap, a stark contrast to the luxurious surroundings where wealthy tourists strolled carefree. Life had never been easy for Jamal. Orphaned at the tender age of 10 when his mother passed away, he was raised by his grandmother, Donna Clotilda, a strong and resilient woman who did everything in her power to keep their small family together despite the constant adversities they faced. As Jamal made his way home from another exhausting day at the local restaurant where he washed dishes, he couldn't help but feel a mix of envy and sadness. He observed from a distance a group of white teenagers laughing and having fun in the park. The palm trees swayed gently with the breeze, and the sun began to set, painting the sky in vibrant shades of orange and pink. Must be nice, Jamal muttered under his breath, his eyes lingering on the carefree group. He couldn't remember the last time he felt that free, that unburdened. Every day was a struggle to help his grandmother pay the bills and avoid trouble in their neighborhood. From an early age, Jamal had learned to navigate the pitfalls of life in a poor neighborhood where violence and lack of opportunities were constant companions. He'd seen friends and acquaintances fall victim to the streets, but he was determined to forge a different path for himself. As he walked, memories of his mother flooded his mind. Her warm smile, her gentle touch, the way she'd sing him to sleep even after working long hours. The pain of her loss still felt fresh, even after seven years. Jamal often wondered what she'd think of him now, working so hard to make ends meet and dreaming of a better future. His reverie was abruptly interrupted by the sound of screeching tires. A police car had stopped beside him, its presence immediately setting Jamal on edge. His heart began to race as two officers stepped out of the vehicle, their faces stern and suspicious. Hey, boy, one of the officers called out, his tone intimidating and disdainful. What are you doing here? Jamal froze in place, his mind racing. He'd seen this scenario play out before with friends and acquaintances. He knew what was coming, and the knowledge filled him with dread. I'm just heading home from work, sir, Jamal replied, trying to keep his voice steady and his head down. He could feel beads of sweat forming on his forehead, not just from the Miami heat but from the tension of the moment. Without further questions, the officers began to search him. They threw his belongings on the ground, treating him like a criminal. Jamal tried to explain that he wasn't doing anything wrong, but his words fell on deaf ears. Spread, M. The taller officer commanded, roughly pushing Jamal against the side of the police car. As they checked his pockets and scattered the contents of his backpack on the sidewalk, Jamal felt a mixture of humiliation and anger rising within him. He glanced around, noticing that the white teenagers he'd seen earlier were now watching the scene unfold. Some were even laughing. This isn't right, Jamal thought, his fists clenching at his sides. I haven't done anything wrong. Why are they treating me like this? Before he could voice his protests, Jamal found himself handcuffed and shoved into the back of the police car. The cold metal of the handcuffs bit into his wrists, a stark reminder of his powerlessness in this situation. As the car pulled away, Jamal caught a glimpse of his scattered belongings on the sidewalk. His textbooks, the lunch his grandmother had packed for him, even the photo of his mother he always carried, all left behind on the dirty pavement. The drive to the police station was a blur of fear and confusion for Jamal. He tried to steady his breathing, to think clearly about what was happening, but panic kept threatening to overwhelm him. He thought of his grandmother, how worried she would be when he didn't come home on time. He thought of his job at the restaurant. Would they fire him if he didn't show up for his next shift? At the police station, a cold, imposing building that seemed to loom over him, Jamal was led to an interrogation room. The fluorescent lights buzzed overhead, casting harsh shadows across the bare walls. 
The room smelled of stale coffee and desperation. Sit down, one of the officers ordered, pointing to a metal chair at a small table. Jamal complied, his legs feeling weak beneath him. He watched as the officers whispered to each other, occasionally glancing in his direction with looks of contempt. Why am I here? Jamal finally found the courage to ask, his voice barely above a whisper. The taller officer, whose nameplate read Officer Briggs, turned to him with a sneer. You fit the description of a suspect in a recent robbery. Care to tell us where you were last night around 10 p.m.? Jamal's mind raced. Last night at 10 p.m., he had been at home, studying for a test and helping his grandmother with her medication. But would they believe him? I was at home, sir, Jamal replied, trying to keep his voice steady. With my grandmother, I was studying and helping her with her meds. Officer Briggs exchanged a look with his partner, skepticism clear on their faces. And I suppose you have someone who can verify that? Jamal nodded. Yes, my grandmother. And our neighbor, Mrs. Rodriguez, she came over to borrow some sugar. She saw me there. The officers continued to question Jamal, their tone growing increasingly aggressive. They asked about his friends, his activities, whether he'd ever been in trouble with the law before. With each question, Jamal felt more and more like a criminal, despite knowing he'd done nothing wrong. Hours seemed to pass in that small, oppressive room. Jamal's stomach growled. He hadn't eaten since lunch, and the stress of the situation was taking its toll. His wrists ached from the tight handcuffs, and his head throbbed from the harsh lighting and constant questioning. Finally, after what seemed like an eternity, the door to the interrogation room opened. A tall, distinguished-looking man in a sheriff's uniform entered. His nameplate read Sheriff Richard Roberts. Sheriff Roberts looked at Jamal, then at the two officers. His expression was unreadable. Gentlemen, a word outside, please, he said, his voice calm but authoritative. As the officers left the room with Sheriff Roberts, Jamal slumped in his chair, exhausted and scared. He could hear muffled voices from outside, but couldn't make out what was being said. He closed his eyes, trying to find some inner strength to face whatever came next. After what felt like hours but was probably only minutes, the door opened again. Sheriff Roberts entered alone, his face now showing a mix of concern and sympathy. Jamal Johnson, he asked, his tone much gentler than that of the other officers. Jamal nodded, sitting up straighter in his chair. I apologize for this situation, Sheriff Roberts said, taking a seat across from Jamal. There's been a misunderstanding. We've verified your alibi with your grandmother and neighbor. You're free to go. Relief washed over Jamal, but it was quickly replaced by anger and confusion. A misunderstanding, he repeated, his voice shaking slightly. I was treated like a criminal, humiliated in front of everyone for a misunderstanding. Sheriff Roberts had the decency to look ashamed. You're right to be upset, Jamal. What happened to you today? It shouldn't have happened. I want you to know that I'll be launching a full investigation into this incident. Jamal stood up, his legs still a bit shaky. Can I go home now? He asked, trying to keep his voice from breaking. Sheriff Roberts nodded, standing as well. Yes, of course. I'll have an officer drive you home. And Jamal... I'd like to speak with you again, if you're willing. Not as a suspect, but as a citizen who's been wronged. Your experience could help us make some much-needed changes in this department. As Jamal was led out of the station, he felt a mix of emotions, relief at being free, anger at what had happened to him, and a small spark of hope at Sheriff Robert's words. Maybe, just maybe, Something good could come out of this horrible experience. The ride home was quiet, Jamal lost in his thoughts. When they pulled up in front of his grandmother's small, well-kept house, he saw Donna Clotilda standing on the porch, her face lined with worry. As soon as the car stopped, she rushed down the steps, engulfing Jamal in a tight hug. Oh, my boy, 
she whispered, her voice thick with emotion. I was so worried. Are you all right? Jamal hugged her back, feeling the tension of the day start to melt away in his grandmother's embrace. I'm okay, grandma. He assured her, though his voice trembled slightly. It was all a mistake. They let me go. Donna Clotilda pulled back, cupping Jamal's face in her weathered hands. Her eyes, wise and loving, searched his face. Come inside, child. You must be hungry. I'll fix you something to eat, and you can tell me everything. As they walked into the house, arm in arm, Jamal felt a surge of love and gratitude for his grandmother. She had always been his rock, his constant support in a world that often seemed stacked against him. Inside, the familiar sense of home, a mix of his grandmother's cooking and the lavender air freshener she loved, washed over Jamal. He sank into a chair at the kitchen table, suddenly feeling the full weight of exhaustion from the day's events. Donna Clotilda bustled around the kitchen, reheating a plate of food for Jamal. As she worked, she kept glancing at him, her eyes filled with a mixture of relief and concern. Now, tell me everything, she said, placing a steaming plate of his favorite dish, her homemade jerk chicken with rice and peas, in front of him. As Jamal ate, he recounted the events of the day, the stop by the police, the humiliating search, the hours of interrogation. With each word, he could see the pain and anger growing in his grandmother's eyes. It's not right, Donna Clotilda said, shaking her head. You're a good boy, Jamal. You work hard, you study hard. They had no right to treat you like that. Jamal nodded, pushing his food around on his plate. I know, Grandma, but what can we do? It's their word against mine. Donna Clotilda reached across the table, taking Jamal's hand in hers. We fight, my boy. We fight for what's right. Your mother would have wanted that. At the mention of his mother, Jamal felt a lump form in his throat. I miss her, Grandma, he said softly. I wonder what she would think of all this. She would be so proud of you, Jamal, Donna Clotilda assured him, her voice firm. So proud of the young man you've become. And she would be ready to take on the whole world to protect you, just like I am. Jamal managed a small smile, feeling a warmth spread through his chest at his grandmother's words. Thank you, Grandma. I don't know what I'd do without you. As they sat there, hand in hand across the worn kitchen table, Jamal felt a renewed sense of determination. He may have been knocked down today, but he wasn't out. With his grandmother's love and support, he knew he could face whatever challenges came his way. The next morning, Jamal woke up early, his mind still whirling with the events of the previous day. He could hear his grandmother moving around in the kitchen, the familiar sounds of her morning routine providing a comforting backdrop to his tumultuous thoughts. As he got dressed for work, Jamal caught sight of himself in the mirror. The face that looked back at him seemed older somehow, as if the experiences of yesterday had aged him overnight. He straightened his shoulders, determined not to let what happened break his spirit. In the kitchen, Donna Clotilda was just finishing up breakfast. The smell of fresh coffee and bacon filled the air, a stark contrast to the cold, sterile atmosphere of the police station where Jamal had spent hours the day before. Good morning, Grandma, Jamal said, giving her a quick kiss on the cheek before sitting down at the table. Good morning, my boy, Donna Clotilda replied, setting a plate of food in front of him. How are you feeling today? Jamal took a deep breath, considering the question. I'm okay, I think, he said slowly. Still angry about what happened, but I, I don't want to let it control me, you know? Donna Clotilda nodded, a proud smile on her face. That's my strong boy. You've always had a good head on your shoulders, just like your mother. As they ate breakfast together, the phone rang. Donna Clotilda answered it, her expression changing from curiosity to surprise as she listened to the person on the other end. Yes, he's here, she said, glancing at Jamal. Just a moment. She held out the phone to Jamal. 
It's for you, child. It's Sheriff Roberts. Jamal took the phone, his heart rate picking up slightly. Hello, he said, trying to keep his voice steady. Good morning, Jamal. Sheriff Roberts' voice came through the line. I hope I'm not calling too early. I wanted to check in on you. See how you're doing after yesterday's incident. Jamal glanced at his grandmother, who was watching him with concern. I'm okay, sir, he replied. Just trying to move on, I guess. I understand, Sheriff Roberts said. Listen, Jamal, I meant what I said yesterday about wanting to talk to you further. Your experience, it's not unique, unfortunately. But your voice could help make a real difference. Would you be willing to meet with me later today? Maybe after your work shift. Jamal hesitated, unsure. Part of him wanted to put the whole thing behind him, to try and forget it ever happened. But another part, a stronger part, knew that staying silent wouldn't help anyone. Okay, he finally said. I get off work at six. I could meet you after that. Excellent, Sheriff Roberts replied, sounding genuinely pleased. How about we meet at Bayfront Park? It's public, neutral ground. Does that work for you? Jamal agreed, and they set a time to meet. After hanging up, he filled his grandmother in on the conversation. I'm proud of you for agreeing to meet with him, Donna Clotilda said, patting Jamal's hand. But be careful, my boy, and call me if you need anything, you hear? Jamal nodded, feeling a mix of nervousness and determination as he headed out for his shift at the restaurant. The day passed in a blur of dirty dishes and bustling kitchen noise, but Jamal's mind kept returning to the upcoming meeting with Sheriff Roberts. As his shift ended, Jamal changed out of his work clothes and made his way to Bayfront Park. The sun was starting to set, casting a warm glow over the water and the city skyline. He spotted Sheriff Roberts sitting on a bench near the water, dressed in casual clothes rather than his uniform. Jamal, Sheriff Roberts greeted him, standing up as Jamal approached. Thank you for coming. Would you like to walk and talk? Jamal nodded, falling into step beside the sheriff as they began to stroll along the waterfront. For a few moments, they walked in silence, the sounds of the city and the lapping of the waves against the shore filling the air. I want to apologize again for what happened yesterday, Sheriff Roberts finally said, his voice sincere. It was a clear case of racial profiling, and it's unacceptable. Jamal felt a surge of emotions at the sheriff's words, anger, pain, but also a glimmer of hope that someone in authority was acknowledging the problem. It's not just me, Jamal said, his voice quiet but firm. It happens to my friends, to people in my neighborhood, all the time. We're always seen as suspects, never as just people. Sheriff Roberts nodded, his expression grave. You're right. And that's why I wanted to talk to you, Jamal. I want to make changes in the department, real changes. But to do that, I need to understand the experiences of people like you. Would you be willing to share your story? To help us create better training programs, better policies? Jamal stopped walking, turning to face the sheriff. Why me? He asked. Why does my story matter more than all the others? Sheriff Roberts met Jamal's gaze steadily. Because you're here, Jamal. Because you're willing to speak up. And because, well, there's something I need to tell you. Something about your past, about your mother. Jamal felt his heart skip a beat. My mother? What about her? Sheriff Roberts took a deep breath, his expression a mix of apprehension and determination. Jamal, what I'm about to tell you, it's not easy, but you deserve to know the truth. Jamal felt his heart racing, a mix of curiosity and fear coursing through him. What is it? He asked, his voice barely above a whisper. Roberts gestured to a nearby bench. Let's sit down, he said gently. As they settled onto the bench, the sheriff turned to face Jamal, his eyes filled with a deep, unreadable emotion. Jamal, I... I knew your mother. Roberts began, his voice thick with emotion. She was an incredible woman, strong, 
determined, and full of life. We, we had a brief relationship years ago. Jamal felt as if the ground was shifting beneath him. He gripped the edge of the bench, trying to steady himself. You knew my mother, he repeated, his mind struggling to process this new information. Roberts nodded, his gaze never leaving Jamal's face. Yes, and there's more. Jamal, I, I'm your father. The words hung in the air between them, heavy and life-altering. Jamal felt as if he'd been punched in the gut, all the air leaving his lungs in a rush. He stared at Roberts, searching his face for any sign of deception, but finding only sincerity and regret. My, my father? Jamal stammered, his voice barely audible. But how? Why didn't I know? Why weren't you there? Roberts ran a hand over his face, his shoulders sagging under the weight of his confession. I didn't know about you until recently, Jamal. Your mother, she never told me she was pregnant. By the time I found out, it was too late. She was gone, and you were being raised by your grandmother. Jamal felt a whirlwind of emotions, anger, confusion, hurt, and a strange sense of longing he couldn't quite name. He stood up abruptly, needing to move, to do something to process this bombshell that had just been dropped on him. Why are you telling me this now? He demanded, pacing in front of the bench. After all these years, after what happened yesterday, why now? Robert stood as well, his hands open in a gesture of openness. Because you deserve to know the truth, Jamal. And because, because I want to make things right. I want to be a part of your life, if you'll let me. Jamal laughed bitterly. Make things right? How? You can't undo years of absence. You can't erase the struggles my grandmother and I have been through. You're right. Roberts agreed, his voice heavy with regret. I can't change the past, but I can try to make a difference now. For you, and for others like you who face injustice every day. Jamal stopped pacing, turning to face Roberts, his father. The word felt strange, even in his thoughts. And how do you plan to do that? He asked, a challenge in his voice. Roberts took a step towards Jamal, his eyes filled with determination. By using my position to make real changes in the police department, by implementing better training, by holding officers accountable for their actions, and by listening to voices like yours, Jamal, You've lived the reality of what it means to be a young black man in this city. Your experiences, your insights, they're invaluable. Jamal felt torn. Part of him wanted to reject Roberts outright, to turn his back on this man who claimed to be his father but had been absent for his entire life. But another part, a part that had always wondered about his father, that had always felt a void in his life, was curious. And beyond that, there was a small voice inside him that recognized the potential for real change. I, I need time to process this, Jamal said finally, his voice shaky. It's a lot to take in. Roberts nodded, understanding in his eyes. Of course. Take all the time you need, Jamal. I'm not going anywhere. When you're ready, if you're ever ready, I'll be here. As Jamal turned to leave, Roberts called out one last time. Jamal, thank you for listening. I'm proud of the man you've become. Your mother would be too. Jamal didn't respond, but he felt those words settle deep in his chest as he walked away, his mind reeling from everything he'd just learned. The sun had fully set now, and the lights of the city twinkled around him, a fitting backdrop to the turmoil in his heart. As he made his way home, Jamal's mind was a whirlwind of thoughts and emotions. The revelation that Sheriff Roberts was his father had turned his world upside down. He walked aimlessly through the streets of Miami, barely noticing the bustling nightlife around him. When he finally reached his grandmother's house, Jamal paused at the front door, taking a deep breath to compose himself. He knew Donna Clotilda would be waiting up for him, worried about his meeting with the sheriff. As he stepped inside, the familiar sense of home washed over him,
bringing a small measure of comfort. Donna Clotilda was sitting in her favorite armchair, her hands busy with her knitting, but her eyes immediately focused on Jamal as he entered. Jamal, how did it go, child? She asked, setting aside her knitting and leaning forward with concern. Jamal sank onto the couch, feeling the weight of the day's revelations pressing down on him. Grandma, he began, his voice barely above a whisper. I, I found out who my father is. Donna Clotilda's eyes widened in surprise. Your father? But how? What did Sheriff Roberts tell you? Jamal took a deep breath, stealing himself. Grandma, Sheriff Roberts is my father. The silence that followed was deafening. Donna Clotilda's face went through a range of emotions, shock, disbelief, and finally, a deep sadness. She closed her eyes for a moment, as if gathering her strength, before speaking. Oh, my boy, she said softly, moving to sit beside Jamal on the couch. I, I had my suspicions, but I was never sure. Jamal turned to her, surprise etched on his face. You knew? You knew who my father was all this time. Donna Clotilda shook her head gently. No, not for certain. Your mother, she never told me outright who your father was. But there were things she said, looks that passed between her and Richard Roberts when they thought no one was watching. I wondered, but I couldn't be sure. Jamal felt a surge of conflicting emotions, anger at the secrets kept from him, confusion about his place in the world, and a deep, aching sadness for the years lost. Why didn't she tell him about me? Why didn't she tell me about him? Donna Clotilde sighed, taking Jamal's hand in hers. Your mother, she was a complicated woman, Jamal. She had her reasons, I'm sure. Maybe she thought she was protecting you, or maybe she was afraid. I don't know. But what I do know is that she loved you more than anything in this world. Jamal felt tears stinging his eyes. I just... I don't know how to feel about all this, Grandma. He wants to be a part of my life now, but where was he all these years? And how can I trust him after what happened with those officers? Donna Clotilda pulled Jamal into a tight hug, her voice gentle but firm. Listen to me, my boy. You don't have to decide anything right now. You take all the time you need to process this. And whatever you decide, I'll be right here beside you. You understand. Jamal nodded, feeling a wave of gratitude for his grandmother's unwavering support. Thanks, Grandma, he murmured into her shoulder. As they sat there, wrapped in each other's embrace, Jamal felt the turmoil in his heart begin to settle, if only slightly. He knew he had a long road ahead of him, figuring out his relationship with Roberts, dealing with the aftermath of his wrongful arrest, and navigating the complex emotions that came with discovering his father's identity. But for now, in the warmth of his grandmother's arms and the safety of their small home, Jamal allowed himself a moment of peace. Tomorrow would bring new challenges, new decisions to make. But tonight, he was just a boy seeking comfort in the arms of the woman who had always been there for him. As the days passed, Jamal found himself grappling with the newfound knowledge of his father's identity. He threw himself into his work at the restaurant, finding solace in the rhythm of washing dishes and the camaraderie of his co-workers. But even as he tried to maintain a sense of normalcy, the weight of recent events hung heavy on his shoulders. One afternoon, as Jamal was finishing up his shift, his best friend Marcus burst into the kitchen, his eyes wide with excitement. Jamal, man, you won't believe what's happening. Jamal looked up from the sink, raising an eyebrow at his friend's enthusiasm. What's going on, Marcus? Marcus grabbed Jamal's arm, pulling him towards the back door. There's a protest happening downtown. People are speaking out against police brutality and racial profiling. We gotta go, man. This is our chance to make our voices heard. Jamal hesitated, torn between his desire to participate and his fear of potential consequences. I don't know, Marcus. After what happened with those officers. Marcus's expression softened, 
understanding in his eyes. I get it, bro. But that's exactly why we need to be there. Your story, what happened to you, it's happening to kids like us all over the city. We can't stay silent anymore. Jamal thought about Sheriff Roberts, his father, and the promise of change he had made. He thought about his grandmother's unwavering support and the memory of his mother's strength. Finally, he nodded. All right, let's go. The two friends made their way downtown, the sounds of chanting growing louder as they approached the protest site. A diverse crowd had gathered, holding signs and shouting slogans demanding justice and equality. Jamal felt a surge of energy as he and Marcus joined the throng. As they moved through the crowd, Jamal caught sight of a familiar face, Sheriff Roberts, standing at the edge of the protest, watching with a mix of concern and something that looked like pride. Their eyes met across the sea of people, and for a moment, Jamal felt a connection he couldn't quite explain. Suddenly, a commotion broke out near the front of the protest. Jamal and Marcus pushed forward to see what was happening. To their horror, they saw several officers roughly handling a young black teenager, not much younger than themselves. Without thinking, Jamal stepped forward. Stop, he shouted, his voice carrying over the noise of the crowd. He's not doing anything wrong. The officers turned, their eyes landing on Jamal. One of them, a burly man with a sneer on his face, started towards him. Stay out of this, kid, unless you want to join your friend here. Jamal felt fear coursing through him, but he stood his ground. No, he said, his voice steady despite his racing heart. I won't stay out of it. This is wrong, and you know it. The tension in the air was palpable. The crowd had gone quiet, all eyes on the confrontation unfolding before them. Just as the officer reached for his handcuffs, a voice cut through the silence. That's enough, Officer Johnson. Sheriff Roberts strode forward, his face set in a mask of determination. He positioned himself between Jamal and the officer, his presence commanding respect even without his uniform. Sir, this boy was interfering with Dash, the officer began, but Roberts cut him off. I saw what happened, Johnson. That young man wasn't doing anything to warrant that kind of treatment. Stand down. Now. The officer hesitated for a moment before stepping back, frustration evident on his face. Roberts turned to the crowd, his voice carrying across the gathering. I want to apologize for what you've witnessed here today. This is not how our officers are trained to behave, and I assure you, there will be consequences. He paused, his eyes finding Jamal in the crowd. We have a lot of work to do to rebuild trust between law enforcement and the community. But I promise you, we are committed to making real, lasting changes. As the crowd began to disperse, murmuring among themselves about what they'd just witnessed, Roberts approached Jamal. That was brave, what you did, he said quietly. Stepping in like that, Jamal met his father's eyes, feeling a mix of emotions he couldn't quite name. Someone had to, he replied simply. Roberts nodded, a small smile playing at the corners of his mouth. You're right. And that's why we need voices like yours, Jamal, to hold us accountable, to push for change. As they stood there, father and son in the midst of a crowd fighting for justice, Jamal felt something shift inside him. He didn't know what the future held or how his relationship with Roberts would develop. But he knew, in that moment, that he had the power to make a difference. And he was ready to use it. In the days following the protest, Jamal found himself at the center of a whirlwind of activity. News of his confrontation with the police officer had spread quickly, and he suddenly found himself thrust into the spotlight as a symbol of resistance against police brutality. Local news stations wanted to interview him, community organizations reached out for his support, and even his co-workers at the restaurant treated him with a new level of respect. It was overwhelming, to say the least. 
One evening, as Jamal sat on the front porch of his grandmother's house, trying to make sense of everything that had happened, he heard the familiar sound of Marcus's footsteps coming up the walkway. Hey, man, Marcus greeted, settling down next to Jamal on the porch steps. How you holding up? Jamal shrugged, his eyes fixed on the setting sun. I don't know, Marcus. It's all so much. I never wanted to be the face of anything, you know? I just wanted to do what was right. Marcus nodded, understanding in his eyes. I get it, bro. But sometimes doing what's right means stepping up, even when you didn't plan to. You've got a platform now. The question is, what are you going to do with it? As they sat in companionable silence, Jamal's mind wandered to the conversation he'd had with Sheriff Roberts, his father, after the protest. The offer to help create change from within the system still stood, but Jamal wasn't sure if that was the right path for him. Sheriff Roberts wants me to help with some new training programs for the police department, Jamal said finally, turning to look at his friend. He thinks my perspective could make a real difference. Marcus raised an eyebrow. And what do you think? Jamal sighed, running a hand through his hair. I don't know, man. Part of me wants to believe that we can change things from the inside. But another part, another part of me is scared. Scared that nothing will really change, that I'll just be used as a token to make them look good. That's a real concern. Marcus agreed, his voice serious. But Jamal, think about it. If you're in there, if you're part of the process, you can make sure that doesn't happen. You can hold them accountable. Before Jamal could respond, the front door opened and Donna Clotilda stepped out onto the porch. I thought I heard voices out here, she said, a warm smile on her face. Marcus, will you be joining us for dinner? Marcus grinned, always happy to partake in Donna Clotilda's cooking. If it's not too much trouble, ma'am. Nonsense. Donna Clotilda waved off his concern. There's always room at our table for you. As they settled around the kitchen table, the aroma of Donna Clotilda's famous jerk chicken filling the air, Jamal felt a sense of comfort wash over him. This was his anchor, his home base in the midst of all the chaos. Grandma, Jamal said as they began to eat, what do you think about me working with Sheriff Roberts on those police training programs? Donna Clotilda paused, her fork halfway to her mouth. She set it down carefully, her eyes meeting Jamal's across the table. I think, she said slowly, that you have an opportunity here, Jamal. An opportunity to make real change. But it won't be easy. You'll face resistance, and there will be times when you'll want to give up. She reached across the table, taking Jamal's hand in hers. But if anyone can do it, it's you, my boy. You have your mother's strength and your own kind of wisdom. Just remember who you are and where you come from. Don't let them change you, you change them. Jamal felt a lump form in his throat at his grandmother's words. He squeezed her hand, nodding silently. The next day, Jamal made his way to the police station, his heart pounding with a mix of nervousness and determination. As he approached the front desk, he saw Sheriff Roberts emerge from his office. Jamal, Roberts greeted him, a smile spreading across his face. I'm glad you came. Are you ready to get started? Jamal took a deep breath, squaring his shoulders. Yes, sir. I'm ready. But I need you to understand something first. Roberts nodded, his expression turning serious. Of course. What is it? I'm not here to be a token, Jamal said firmly, meeting his father's eyes. I'm not here to make the department look good without any real change happening. I'm here to make a difference, to make sure that what happened to me doesn't happen to anyone else. And if I feel like that's not happening, I'm out. No questions asked. For a moment, Roberts was silent, studying Jamal's face. Then, slowly, he nodded. I understand, Jamal. And I respect that. That's exactly the kind of commitment and integrity we need. I promise you, we're in this for real change. And I'm grateful to have you on board. 
As they walked together towards the conference room where the first training session would be held, Jamal felt a mix of emotions. He was stepping into unknown territory, taking on a role he never imagined for himself. But he also felt a sense of purpose, a determination to use this opportunity to make a real difference. He thought of his mother, of the strength she must have had to raise him on her own. He thought of his grandmother, her unwavering support and wisdom guiding him even now. And he thought of Marcus, of all the other young men and women in his community who were counting on him to be their voice. As they reached the door of the conference room, Roberts paused, turning to Jamal. Are you ready? He asked, his hand on the doorknob. Jamal took a deep breath, nodding. I'm ready, he said, his voice steady and sure. As they stepped into the room full of police officers, all eyes turning to them, Jamal felt a surge of courage. This was where the real work began. This was where he could start to make a difference. And he was ready for the challenge. The conference room fell silent as Jamal and Sheriff Roberts entered. The officers, a mix of veterans and rookies, watched with curiosity and some apprehension as Jamal took his place at the front of the room beside Roberts. Good morning, everyone, Roberts began, his voice carrying authority and respect. We're here today to begin a new chapter in our department's history, a chapter focused on understanding, empathy, and building trust with our community. He gestured to Jamal. This is Jamal Johnson. Some of you may have heard about him in the news recently. Jamal has agreed to work with us to help improve our training and our relationships with the community we serve. Jamal scanned the room, taking in the faces before him. Some looked interested, others skeptical, and a few even appeared hostile. He took a deep breath, reminding himself why he was there. Thank you, Sheriff Roberts, Jamal said, his voice steady despite his nerves. I'm here today because I believe change is possible. I'm here because I've experienced firsthand the consequences of racial profiling and police brutality. But I'm also here because I believe that most of you want to do the right thing, to protect and serve all members of our community equally. He paused, letting his words sink in. I'm not here to point fingers or assign blame. I'm here to share my experiences, to help you understand what it's like to be a young black man in this city, and to work with you to find better ways of doing things. As Jamal spoke, he could see the expressions in the room shifting. Some of the hostility faded, replaced by curiosity and, in some cases, genuine interest. One officer, an older man with graying hair, raised his hand. With all due respect, son, how can you understand what we go through? The dangers we face every day. Jamal nodded, acknowledging the question. You're right, sir. I don't know what it's like to be a police officer. Just like many of you don't know what it's like to be a young black man in this city. That's why I'm here. So we can learn from each other. Another officer, a young woman not much older than Jamal, spoke up. What happened to you with those officers? How can we make sure that doesn't happen again? Jamal felt a surge of hope at the genuine concern in her voice. That's exactly what we're here to figure out, he replied. It starts with understanding, with seeing each other as human beings first. It's about training, yes, but it's also about changing the culture, about holding each other accountable. As the session continued, Jamal shared his story in detail, the fear, the humiliation, the anger he felt during his wrongful arrest. He talked about growing up in a neighborhood where trust in the police was low, where young men like him were often seen as suspects first and citizens second. The officers listened, some with growing understanding, others still resistant. But as the hours passed, Jamal could see minds beginning to open, perspectives starting to shift. By the end of the session, Several officers approached Jamal, thanking him for his honesty and expressing their desire to do better. It wasn't universal. There were still those who remained skeptical or resistant, but it was a start. As the room cleared out, 
Sheriff Roberts approached Jamal, pride evident in his eyes. You did well today, Jamal. Really well. How are you feeling? Jamal took a deep breath, feeling a mix of exhaustion and exhilaration. It's a lot to process, he admitted. But I think, I think we made some progress today. Roberts nodded, placing a hand on Jamal's shoulder. We did. And it's just the beginning. Are you ready for what comes next? Jamal thought about the challenges ahead, the resistance they'd face, the hard conversations yet to come. But he also thought about the potential for real change, the possibility of creating a safer, more just community for everyone. I'm ready, he said, his voice firm with conviction. Whatever comes next, I'm ready. As they left the station together, father and son, Jamal felt a sense of purpose he'd never experienced before. He knew the road ahead would be difficult, but he was prepared to face it. With his grandmother's wisdom, his friend Marcus's support, and now his father's guidance, Jamal was ready to be the change he wanted to see in the world. The sun was setting as they stepped outside, painting the sky in vibrant hues of orange and pink. To Jamal, it felt like a new dawn, the beginning of something important, and he was determined to see it through, no matter what challenges lay ahead. In the weeks following the initial training session, Jamal continued to work closely with Sheriff Roberts and the police department. His presence and input began to make a tangible difference, slowly but surely shifting the culture within the force. One afternoon, as Jamal was leaving the station after another productive meeting, Sheriff Roberts called him into his office. The expression on his father's face was a mix of determination and satisfaction. Jamal, I wanted you to be the first to know. Roberts began, gesturing for Jamal to take a seat. We've concluded the internal investigation into your wrongful arrest as well as the incident at the protest. Jamal leaned forward, his heart racing. And Roberts nodded gravely. The officers involved in your arrest have been suspended without pay and will be required to undergo extensive retraining before they can return to active duty. As for Officer Johnson, the one from the protest, he's been demoted and reassigned to desk duty pending further evaluation. Jamal felt a wave of emotions wash over him, relief, vindication, and a surprising amount of empathy for the officers facing consequences. That's, that's good, he said slowly. But what happens next? How do we make sure this leads to real change? Robert smiled, pride evident in his eyes. That's where you come in, son. Your insight, your experiences, they're invaluable in shaping our path forward. As the weeks turned into months, Jamal found himself spending more and more time at the station, working alongside his father. He watched as Roberts handled difficult situations with a mix of compassion and firmness, always striving to do what was right, even when it wasn't easy. One evening, as they were leaving the station together, Jamal turned to his father. You know, when I first found out you were my dad, I didn't know what to think. But now, I'm proud to be your son. Roberts's eyes glistened with emotion. And I'm proud to be your father, Jamal. You've taught me so much about courage and integrity. You're changing this department, this community, for the better. Their relationship deepened, evolving into a partnership based on mutual respect and shared values. Jamal found himself developing a newfound admiration not just for his father, but for the potential of law enforcement to be a force for good in the community. As Jamal's involvement with the police department grew, so did the demands on his time. He was still working at the restaurant, trying to help his grandmother make ends meet while also attending community college part-time. The strain was beginning to show. One day, Sheriff Roberts approached Jamal with a proposition. Son, I've been thinking. You're doing important work here, and your studies are crucial for your future. I'd like to help support you and your grandmother financially, so you can focus on your education and our work here at the department. Jamal was taken aback. Dad, I, 
I don't know what to say. That's a lot to offer. Roberts smiled warmly. You're my son, Jamal. And more than that, you're doing vital work for this community. Let me do this for you. After discussing it with his grandmother, Jamal accepted the offer. With the financial burden eased, he was able to quit his job at the restaurant and focus on his studies and his work with the police department. Years passed, and Jamal's influence continued to grow. He graduated from college with a degree in criminal justice, all while continuing his work with the police department. His unique perspective and unwavering commitment to justice made him a respected figure in the community and within law enforcement circles. As Sheriff Roberts neared retirement age, whispers began to circulate about who would take his place. Many eyes turned to Jamal, who had become an integral part of the department's progressive reforms. On a warm summer evening, much like the one when Jamal had first learned the truth about his father, Roberts invited him for a walk in Bayfront Park. As they strolled along the waterfront, Roberts turned to his son. Jamal, I'm planning to retire next year, he said, his voice filled with emotion. And I can't think of anyone better suited to take my place than you. Jamal stopped in his tracks, stunned. Me? Dad, are you sure? There must be more experienced officers. Roberts shook his head, smiling. Experience isn't everything, son. You have something more important, vision, integrity, and the trust of both the department and the community. You're the bridge we need. After much consideration and discussion with his grandmother and Marcus, Jamal decided to accept the nomination. The selection process was rigorous, but Jamal's track record of positive change and community engagement made him a standout candidate. Finally, the day came when Jamal Johnson was sworn in as the new sheriff. As he stood before a crowd of officers, community members, and reporters, Jamal felt the weight of responsibility settling on his shoulders. He saw his grandmother in the front row, tears of pride in her eyes. Marcus was there too, grinning from ear to ear. And beside them sat his father, Sheriff Roberts, now retired but beaming with pride. As Jamal began his speech, he thought about the long journey that had brought him to this moment, from a scared teenager being wrongfully arrested to the leader of the very department that had once mistreated him. I stand before you today not just as your new sheriff, but as a member of this community, Jamal began, his voice strong and clear. I've seen firsthand the harm that can come from mistrust between law enforcement and the people we serve. But I've also seen the incredible good that can be done when we work together, when we listen to each other, and when we strive for true justice. He paused, looking out at the faces before him, officers he'd worked alongside, community members he'd fought for, his family who had supported him every step of the way. As your sheriff, I promise to continue the work we've started, to build trust, to ensure accountability, and to serve all members of our community with equal respect and dedication. Together, we can create a model of what law enforcement should be, a force for positive change, for justice, and for the betterment of all our lives. As applause filled the air, Jamal felt a sense of purpose and hope unlike anything he'd experienced before. He knew the road ahead would be challenging, but he was ready. With the lessons of his past, the support of his loved ones, and his unwavering commitment to justice, Sheriff Jamal Johnson was ready to lead his community into a brighter, more equitable future. If you liked this story, please like the video and subscribe to the channel. And this video suggested below will certainly surprise you. Have a good session and see you in the next story.